Chiseke, this trip to China was a total waste of time and it is fault. If you want to know more about that story, hang around. We're going to talk about it at the end of this video. Hello, my name is Christian Gerone. I'm the francophone editor of the China Global South. And today I'm bringing you back another video of China in the Global South. And we are going to talk about, again, President Chisekedi's trip to China. We started that series last week. And since the trip happened last week and ended up this week, so we're going to kind of wrap up and talk about really what unfolded during this trip the highs, the lows, and the, you know, the middle ground, and what was the success, what was the failure. And we're going to talk about all of that in this video. So this video is going to be a bit long, so stick around so you can kind of get the ideas of really what happened in this video. So you're going to have talk about the highs, you know, the things that happened, the highlights of the, the trip, the, the meetings, the joint communique, the memorandum, the memorandum of understanding sign, the upgrading of the bilateral relationship. We're also going to talk about the laws, the no renegotiation, no substantial contract signed during this trip. And at the end, we're, we're going to talk about this quote-unquote infamous column written by Eric Olander that Chisekedi's trip to China was a total waste of time. So let's start by the highs during this trip. So what happened that really caught the eyes during this trip? How can we not talk about the welcome ceremony? The welcome ceremony was something great. It was really at the rank of head of states. So President Chisekedi was really welcome with the full protocol that really it deserved as a head of states. So that's what head of state gets when they go to China, the pageantry, the really full-blown protocol that the Chinese state knows how to put in place to make the, the guests welcome and really feel important. And that is a quite important element. I'm going to mention it and also also talked about it on my Twitter, is the fact that many of the states in Africa, when they go to the U.S., for instance, many have been quite struggling to secure and to guarantee meeting with Joe Biden, who was the U.S. president right now. But in general, most of them kind of struggle to secure this meeting in the White House. If they have to, if they have to secure a meeting, sometimes it's going to go through lobbyists and lobbyists trying to lobby the presence in the White House. It's quite, you know demanding, really difficult process they have to face when they go to the U.S. But when they go to China, it's a quite straightforward process. They meet the whole, all the high officials and they have the one... Uh, on uh, the one-to-one -one face with the Chinese President Xi Jinping. And which is, this is a contrast in terms of treatment. And my comment was, how come in, in, in Washington people don't see how much that matters for many African leaders. In the case of the DRC president, President Chisekedi, he's been really showing how much he was close to the U.S. at the beginning of, this, of his term. He went to the U.S. twice, but he was never able to have this face-to-face -face with Joe Biden. Of course, I know people are going to mention the short moment he had with Joe Biden during the during the meeting last December uh, with uh, the U.S.-Africa summit, but that's not the same. I'm talking about a full-blown face-to-face meeting, a bilateral uh, meeting with, with Joe Biden. And that's something that should really make people think a lot in D.C., those who are following me from Washington. Just keep in mind that, you know, in Africa, those things matter. It's, they really matter big time. To treat a head of state with all the respect and all the protocols that really it deserves as a head of state. If you don't do that, people tend to believe that when they go to the U.S., they are not treated with respect. If you want to know more about why China does that and what does it mean and everything, I'm going to advise you to read our colleagues Paul Nantulia, who made a really a very interesting thread. I'm going to put the link in the video so you can see the you're going to see the thread that he made uh, during the during this visit, explaining the tradition and the why is China do that and what does it mean and what's the goal. And when you see when you read that and you see the reaction that's how he was received uh, in uh, the reaction from social media and the officials, the, the Congolese officials, you can see that China struck, struck a nerve there and people were quite pleased with that welcoming ceremony. The second high of this visit was 
the meeting with the Chinese official. He had the meeting with Li Tiang, the prime minister, Zhao Leji, the, uh, the head of National Assembly of China. Of course, he also had a meeting with Xi Jinping, which really was the highlight of the meeting. I think I spoke about those three meetings in the video last week. So those were also the highlights of this of this visit another highlights of this visit is the upgrading of the bilateral relationship between the drc and china they've upgraded the bilateral relationship to comprehensive global strategic partnership which means that the both countries see each other as being important they're going to be consulting together in different issues on international stage they're going to be increasing the trade exchange the commercial uh, co commercial agreements and all different issues so the the question that people have been asking what does it really mean for the drc it means that there are a lot of opportunities to be taken here by the DRC, but whether it's going to be a success or a failure will depend on the DRC capability and ability to really take advantage of that new bilateral agreement. So we're going to know more in the months and the years ahead if the DRC really played this card right to take advantage of this new partnership that the two countries have signed. Finally, the, another highlights of this visit were the signing of five MOUs. They've signed on different issues. I'm going to read out what uh, the Memorandum of Understanding was ab were about. They signed MOUs on investment and ecological exploitation, on information exchange and cooperation, on cooperation and development digital economy, on promoting development of green economy, and also an agreement between the two uh, national television. So those are the highlights and the highs of this uh, of this meeting. And President Shisekedi has also the opportunity to fly to Shenzhen and to um, to Huawei HQ, where they signed another agreement, another MOU on. Um, on digital transformation into the DRC. So those are the highs that happen during this trip. So after the highs, let's not talk about the lows of this trip. So what did not happen? First of all, there was no big new mining deal that was signed during this trip. Despite the coverage and the hype that many media uh, gave before this trip, there was no deal that was signed. As you heard, all the deal was signed so far were MOUs. They are just memorandum of understanding where the two countries are expressing their interest to work in different domain, in different situation, in different aspect of the relationship. But beyond that, there was no no concrete and concrete deal that was signed between DRC and China or Chinese company, nothing. We know that uh, there was meeting between the CIMOC CEO uh, with, uh, and with the Congolese mining minister, and there was some other meeting that happened, but really nothing really concrete came out of those meetings. We also we only know out of this meeting that um the two the two parts of this uh, have agreed to find final to find a final agreement on the CIMOC and Jekamin and Jekamin dispute, but we're still gonna have to wait the details of the agreement that needs to be signed yet. But as I said, no mining deals, no infrastructure, no billion to go to the DRC. And uh, that was quite expected. When you've been following China, Africa closely, you've been following how China has changed its engagement in Africa, you could see that there was nothing that was going to come out of there in terms of huge money um, from China to the DRC. Many countries have been trying um, to secure loan and financing from Chinese companies. That's not just happening. So it was, there was no sign. There was really no, um, no real sign that could hint in the direction that we're going to have big mining deal or a new infrastructure project coming out of this trip. So after that, the second law during this trip was, the I think, the highlights and the expectation that many had uh, 
prior to this trip. You remember last week, I was telling you how many were expecting that this trip would be the moment where DRC would renegotiate the deal that they signed in 2008 with the Chinese company China Railway and uh, and Sino Hydro that gave uh, birth to the Sico Min deal. Many were expecting that's going to happen. Media coverage predicted that President Shisekedi was going to China to renegotiate that. Last week in my video, I mentioned that it was more about him arriving to China and garner the political will from Chinese stakeholders, Chinese officials, that that deal needed to be renegotiated. Uh, it, we couldn't be expecting there were going to be renegotiation, especially when we know that it's only the Friday before his trip to China that he had urged this government to take and to, to, to get in touch with Chinese to, with Chinese company to start the negotiation process. So it was really, um, I think it was a misplaced hope that many had to see that negotiations going to happen in China. And we also can see that China was quite adamant in the pos in its position about what's uh, how things are going to unfold during this process. So when you read the joint statement that the both countries have signed and released, you can see how China is manipulating both the carrot and the stick at the same time, showing how much is interested and willing to keep on investing in the RC to move forward, encouraging his company to 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 abide by the law, to to respect the the agreement they've signed, but then also in the same time also saying that we won't let ourselves being bullied in the DRC, expressing their concern about the security of the investment, the treatment they do receive in the DRC. I'm gonna read you a few part of the joint agreement they've they've signed, so you kind of get the feeling and understanding of what China is expecting and how things are going to unfold in that situation. Congo will further improve the business environment, provide favorable conditions for Chinese enterprise to operate in Congo, and effectively protect their legitimate right and interest, while Chinese should abide by the laws and regulation of Congo. When it comes to the mining deal, hear what the joint statement is saying. Regularly assess mining cooperation and consolidate relevant cooperation in the long term and mutual interest of both countries. In the spirit of mutual trust, pragmatism and fairness, problem arising in the process of cooperation should be resolved through friendly consultation. China will continue to encourage enterprise to accelerate the implementation of agreed infrastructure projects, strengthen mining cooperation with Congo, encourage enterprise to participate in investment in the development of project of Congo new energy battery value chain and support the upgrading of Congo's industry chain and the enhancement of its independent development capacity. So as I was saying earlier, we, you can see how China is both manipulating the stick and the carrot. The carrot is saying, yes, we're going to encourage our company to invest more, to really uh, invest in the EV batteries industry. We're going to really push them to respect and to abide by the agreement they've signed to build infrastructure they need to build in the DRC. But in the same time, they're also saying, we won't let ourselves being bullied. We are urging the DRC to create that environment where we feel safe. And this is the concern that um, China Foreign Affairs Minister Ching Gang had expressed last week, Monday, on the meeting that he had with his counterpart of the DRC when he was saying that they feel that DRC needs to do more when it comes to security. It was both physical and economic security. And the joint statement just took the same wording that we've been saying consistently in different Chinese communiques the one that was released in February by the Chinese embassy and also by the Chinese companies investing in the mining industry in the DRC. It's the same wording that we've been seeing going through Chinese officials through Qingang, through, through Qingang and finally at the, in, in the joint statement that the both countries signed. So it just shows you how much China remain uh, focused and determined to really guarantee the security of its investment in the DRC. But I would like to highlight something for you here because people have been asking, what does it mean? Uh, what does it mean in reality? Are we going to see the renegotiation happening? My answer is, is 
it's we are not sure for at least for now we are not sure if the renegotiation will happen but what we are sure at least we are sure that it's not going to happen the way the DRC was expecting it to happen and this is why i'm saying that i'm going to read again that short portion Regularly assess the mining cooperation and consolidate relevant cooperation in the long term and mutual interest of both countries. In the spirit of mutual trust, pragmatism and fairness, problem arising should be uh, dealt uh, in a makeable situation. Pragmatism and fairness. This idea of pragmatism and fairness is quite, it, it stemmed from the, the idea that when you invest in the mining in the in the mining industry in the DRC, it's a very complex and complicated environment. So, so when Chinese company arrived to invest there, they were willing to take risk. So when today some part of the agreement seems not to be implemented the way the DRC wanted it to be implemented, the statement is telling us in a certain way that we have to take into account the complex situation we found ourselves in. Everybody knows that the RC mining industry is corrupt, is you know, unstable. It's a very difficult environment to invest in. So when companies go there and when they do invest, China is expecting that when you come and treat us asking for a negotiation, you have to take into account all this complex situation and let's not lose sight on the long-term interest of both countries, which tells you that renegotiation will and might happen, but the both countries will make a new assessment. Not the assessment that was made in February by the state auditor's office, but they're going to have a new assessment where they're going to decide which direction we are going to, to go. Based on those assessments, they're going to decide what the way, what's the way forward, which means, first, which means two things. First of all, it's going to be a long process. It's not going to be easy. Especially if what we read is true, that the DRC is wanting to move up its shares in the Sikomin deal from 32% to 70%. We know that Chinese are very tricky um, negotiators. It's going to take a long time, and it's really not guaranteed that that change is going to happen. Second of all, it's going to be tough. It's not going to be easy for Congolese president and government to negotiate with Chinese. They're going, there's going to be a lot of back and forth. Fourth, it's going to take a long time. It's, third, it's going to be long. So if President Chisekid is expecting to show a new contract revised by the end of the year, I'm really not sure. I'm really, I'm really not, I'm really not sure that's going to happen. And especially in the conditions that you want that to happen. We can see adjustment happening. We can see some change happening. But are we going to see a tremendous and complete change from what we have now to a new context that uh, that I'm not sure that's going to happen. So that just tells you how much um, renegotiation of those deals are not going to be easy. Those are the laws of this trip where at the end, comparing to what was presented, to what people were expecting, what people were hoping to happen, did not happen. And I really don't blame people that much. I do blame media in general. I do blame the media that hyped that entry by saying this is going to happen. They're going to have renegotiations, going to have new mining deals to take place. They're going to have a lot of contracts. So when that doesn't happen, people tend to be you know, sad people tend to be, you know, this trip was a waste of time. And this is where we tell people, you really need to follow China closely to pay close attention because China is changing. The way China is engaging himself to in Africa is not the same way it was engaging five, seven years ago. Things have changed. China is not pouring out the money was pouring out before in Africa. Now China's focus has ch have changed from Africa to Latin America and Southeast Asia. Talking about Latin America, this week Argentina signed a almost a billion dollar agreement with Chinese companies' investment. So it just tells you how much Africa is still struggling to get now financing from China, where Nigeria, Kenya, Uganda have been trying to convince Chinese to invest billions in the infrastructure. Chinese companies and Chinese government are just not willing to invest that much money in 
Africa. That just tells you the environment that China is finding himself in Af- itself in Africa and th- how things have changed. So take that, taking that into account, hoping and expecting that there, were, there was going to be huge mining deals and new infrastructure projects, I think it was a bit far-fetched. I don't say that's not going to happen. It may happen. I don't know. So finally, the last part of this video, the column that was written by my colleague Eric Olanda when he talked about President Tshisekedi's trip to China. As I said in the introduction of this video, many people were not happy about what was said in this column. And I bet that many did not even read the column. They just stopped to the title, Waste of Time, and they kind of also stopped on the race of who wrote the, who wrote the article. Because when you go on LinkedIn, you see the different comment, the debate that unfolded. You just realize that many were just not talking, and were not addressing the point he was addressing in his column. And this is what I want to do in this video about that column. So we kind of as Africans ourselves to kind of look back and see what was the problem of that column and see what was said was true, was a lie, was what. Let's unfold that column. So what Eric said in his column was uh, rumors of big mineral trading deal and progress in negotiation to unfair mining deals with Chinese companies seem to have been nothing more than a hype. As I said in my in this video, the bottom line is Chisekedi took almost a week out of his schedule for this trip at the height of a presidential campaign as not, and has nothing to show for it and that his constituent will think that is important. Then he also mentioned the fact that Kenya is still expecting to secure a loan from, uh, from Chinese Exim Bank and to finance the third, the third portion of the, his SGR. He also mentioned that in the 20 plus years of China engagement in Africa, most foreign ministers on the continent still lack robust competency in China affairs. They largely haven't funneled some of the 600,000 African students who, who have returned from China with specialized language and cultural skill into foreign ministers and tends to shun outside counsel on China while still over-prioritizing ties with the Europe and the U.S. But while being clueless about China back in the early notes when it was new was understandable, today that's not the case. There are a lot of highly skilled people available and a flood of information that's both affordable and accessible. That was the cross of his column. And somehow people kind of missed out that part because let's face it, myself, I'm a former st- uh, student from China. I lived in China for 10 years. Those who know me, they know the story. The question is, how many of us do you think are working in foreign affairs ministries, in defense ministries, in different apparatus of African government states? How many do you think? Not many. I'm conducting a research about uh, African alumni from China, what have, what, have, what have happened to them. So far, the early results I've received, many of them are not present in the China-Africa sphere. Many of them are not working for the government. Many of them are working for private sector. And many of them, they're not working remotely to anything that's connect Africa to China. That just tells you how much we really don't use the talent and the people that we do have, the people who know China better, the people who've been to China, the people who speak Chinese, the people who are really have the knowledge about China. We don't really use them and integrate them in our relationship with China. Do you think that's normal than 20 years plus after when a Congolese president goes to China his interpreter is still a Chinese. Do you think that's normal in different bilateral ag- discussions they do have? The translator is still a Chinese translator. That just tells you sometimes how the problem is real. It's those small, tiny problems that reveal that in terms of preparation, in terms of using the talents and the people that are available on the continent, African governments are not really taking China seriously. They're not taking China seriously to the extent that they don't feel the need 
to integrate those former students from China in their foreign affairs minister to really have a deliberate policy towards China to say, we are sending students there so to come back, so to work with us, to uh, to enable us and to allow us to know China better, to have better deals, to have a better agreement, to have better contracts, and to have a better understanding of what China is doing and what's happening with China and how China is going to engage with Africa. That was the crust of the argument. So between you and I, my fellow Africans who are watching this video, what was the problem? of this content? What was the problem of this column? I know that it sometimes feels that, you know, out of our own ego pride, that's how someone can talk about those kind of issues. But the truth of the matter is I'm not white. I'm an African, I'm a black African. The question is, what are we doing about those former students who've been to China, who have a tremendous knowledge and experience about China? What are we doing to them, with them? What are we doing with them in a relationship with China? And I think instead of being angry, instead of feeling that we've been accused of something, it's just more to reflect on ourselves, to think like what we should do better, what we should change in our relationship with China, what the knowledge that we need to 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 garner, to, to integrate in a relationship with China, what's the gap that we need to fill so we can, you know, to have a better relationship with China. So instead of just, you know, debating because the title sounded disrespectful, I don't think it was disrespectful. And personally, I think that if I'd written that, I maybe I would have used harsh word because the reality is it's kind of upsetting to see how Africa is really not taking China seriously enough to think that we really need to integrate much more people who know China. Just last question just for you to think, and for those who are going to to watch this video from China, can you try to guess how many African diplomats based in China are really fluent in Chinese? How many of them speak Chinese? How many of them really follow what's happening in China? You'd be surprised. You'd be surprised. Trust me, I've been there. I know many of them. Trust me, you'd be surprised how many of them they have no clue about China. They don't, even don't speak Chinese. So that just tells you that, you know, we need to do better in our relationship with China. And this is why we are here. This is why the China Global South Project is here to make you smart about China every day, to make to, to, to really tailor the knowledge that you need to know about China engagement in the Global South, in Latin America, in Africa, in Southeast Asia. If you need to know about what China is doing, subscribe to our channel, subscribe to our newsletter to receive daily newsletter coverage about what China is doing in, in Africa and elsewhere in the Global South. In French, we have free newsletter. You just have to visit projetafricchine.com and you can just gonna write your email address to receive by and twice a week um, the newsletter that we, we, we send every Tuesday and every Friday about what China is doing in Africa. We do it in French, in English, in Arabic. This is what we do. This is our job to allow you people to get smart and smart and to know more about China. And this is also an opportunity for me to, to kind of clarify some questions that people had because of the name China Global South. People in Congolese Twitter, especially, they were like, no, this is a Chinese media and everything. I say, no. The China Global South is not a Chinese media. Is an independent media. is made of uh, American, Congolese, Kenyan, Ugandan, South Africans. Uh, many people in the Global South working together to cover China engagement and involvement in the Global South. So you people, so you our countrymen, so you our fellow people from the Global South, you will know China better. This is the job we do. And we really do hope that you're going to subscribe to our content. And in terms of subscribing, you're going to be surprised because of this column. We had a lot of subscribers the last three days. People have been subscribing just to know what has been said because it was beyond the paywall. It's quite disappointing because people like debate and fighting. They're only interested to read when they feel that the title is quite offensive or something. But when it comes to simple information, they really don't know much. So I'm going to stop here. It's been a very, very long video comparing to what we've, we used to do. 
If it's your first time on this channel, as I say, my name is Christian Geronema. I'm the francophone editor of the China Global South Project. So every week, I bring you a new video of China's presence and engagement in the Global South. So if you liked what you saw and you want to know more, click the subscribe button and the notification bell so you can be notified every time we drop a new video about China in the Global South. So I'm going to see you next week for another video of China in the Global South.